I apologize for my um, non-existent or poor French and my necessity to speak to you in English. Um, and I want to thank uh, WECF and Andre and everyone who's invited me and made this possible because it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to talk to you just very briefly about some of our work and how um, I feel and we feel uh, uh, about this increasingly critical situation that we are facing now in our community of environmental and reproductive health. <clears throat> so um, I don't probably need to remind you of the fact that we are, of course, all carrying an enormous chemical burden in our bodies today and that, in fact, our children at the time of birth are carrying these burdens uh, to the extent of an average of 200 chemicals detected in the umbilical cord blood from an environmental working group study. These children were minority infants, and I mention that just to uh, stress the fact that the burden of these chemicals is not equal across society, and there is a question of social justice behind this as well. Um, and the president has uh, declared that the babies today are born pre-polluted. Um, this is a, in my mind, critical situation for the future health of, in fact, the world. Um, I cannot stress this uh, strongly enough <clears throat> that I think this crisis is of a par, on a par with climate change, uh, <clears throat> and uh, must be given uh, resources and attention uh, commensurate with the enormity of this problem that we are facing today. Among these chemicals uh, found in our infants at birth are a class of chemical known as endocrine disruptors. We don't know yet because we have not uh, managed to develop an appropriate uh, testing paradigm uh, how many of those chemicals that were measured are actually in this class of endocrine disruptors. But these are, as you know, chemicals that are exogenous, not made by the body, but they can alter the body's own natural hormonal actions. And because these hormonal actions are critical to every aspect of health and life. They are critical to, uh, to you know, to the future of, of, of our um, species, actually. And so it is um, imperative that these not be in the bodies of mothers and fathers who are um, producing our next generation. There are many of these, of course, and exposure routes are uh, varied. You get these chemicals from every possible means through our skin, um, through our breath, through our food, through our water. <clears throat> and of course we know now that anything to which the mother is exposed, the fetus is also exposed with some exceptions. But that is our default assumption and it's largely been worn out. So. Critics say, yes, of course, there are these chemicals, but they are at so small levels that they cannot possibly do harm to the human body. And so I want to take a minute uh, or two to talk to you about this picture, which I think is beautiful. <laughs> it's a picture of <clears throat> rodent pups that are developing in the uterine horn uh, of, of a mother. And um, you will see that each of those pups is in close proximity to its neighbors. And this is important because the pup will receive hormones from the mother and from his or her own endogenous system, but also from his neighbor or her neighbor. And you can imagine that the amount of hormone that is transferred from one pup to the other is extremely small, and it is. It, but it can. A male between two females will get about one third less testosterone than he would have had 
had he been between two males. Now, how much is this? This is about one part per trillion, or about a drop in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Okay, this is a very low dose. I cannot emphasize that strongly enough. This is a very low dose. And yet it has profound effects on the developing animal, including changes in the size of the genitals and the brain of this animal so that you can measurably predict on the size of what I call the, we're calling the anogenital distance, as uh, what the position was of this animal. So you can measure the anogenital distance after birth and say, was this male between two females or between two males? That's how important this one drop in an Olympic-sized swimming pool is. What about the human? First of all, I want to say that I think that the animal data and the human data are both essential for our progress in this field. They support each other and they are very largely consistent with each other and without one we cannot make conclusions about the other in terms of human health. So I have only limited time. I'm going to focus primarily briefly on one class of chemicals that I have been um, particularly uh, wor working in, and um, that is the phthalates. So the phthalates um, we know are nearly 100% uh, uh, detectable in humans in the Western world at least, where they've been measured. Um, and there are two that I have found in our work to be particularly toxic. Uh, they are the anti-androgenic chemicals diethylhexylphthalate and dibutylphthalate. <coughs> And um, these were studied first in a large number, uh, probably over 100 animal studies, that showed their reproductive toxicity. These chemicals uh, produce in the human body metabolites, urinary metabolites, um, with a lot of um, alphabet soup <laughs> uh, labels. Uh, and uh, there are four of the metabolites of DEHP here, and there are more. This is a large molecule. Um, but this picture is meant to illustrate to you that we get this DEHP in our body, as we do other chemicals, through these multiple routes of exposure. Now, let's look before this woman became pregnant, uh, what was happening. Uh, does it matter to the woman uh, what she's taking into our body before conception or around the time, the periconceptional period. We have to remember that when we, a woman gets a positive pregnancy test, um, she has already survived a 50% chance of failure, uh, of failure of implantation. So that's the first big hit that the fetus or embryo undergoes. And then 30% more are lost in the next six weeks, and most of these will go unrecognized. To a person who is not closely monitored, as most people aren't, this will appear as infertility. So it's very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish between a couple or a woman who is uh, totally infertile and unable to uh, carry a pregnancy to clinical detection. And a very important study just out this week, I think, from Denmark shows that um, women who carry higher levels of MEHP, one of the metabolites, the primary metabolite, of, of the first metabolite of DEHP, have a doubled loss of pregnancy in their conception cycle. So this is a difficult study to do because to do this you have to have people who give you a urine before they get pregnant, and then you have to know what happens to the pregnancy. And for this, you have to have a very special population, which this group in Denmark had available to them. So this is the first evidence that we have, clear evidence that in humans, these chemicals increase infertility and decrease the chance of a clinically recognized pregnancy. We also know that um, 
Another chemical that I don't have time to talk about, but I'm sure you'll talk about here today, which is bisphenol A, uh, doubles the rate of implantation failure. So this is in an in vitro clinic. Uh, higher levels of BPA uh, were found in women who had implantation failure. Uh, this is, again, a special population, an infertility population, but providing unique information about periconceptional loss due to these endocrine disruptors. Now I'd like to go back to DHP and talk about what it can do to the fetus that survives to implantation and to continue to a viable birth. So there have been a number of studies over the past um, 13 years which have pointed out the effects of phthalates on particularly the male uh, developing fetus. And these have been called the phthalate syndrome. Infertility, decreased sperm count, cryptorchidism, and hypospadias. And we have added to that a shortened anagenital distance. These, the phthalate syndrome bears a close affiliation, if you will, to the testicular dysgenesis syndrome that was proposed by Skekebeck and Sharp. And this is no longer a hypothesis. I think we have now sufficient data to take this as an established syndrome. This is actually caused in animals by DEHP. And so we asked, what about humans? And we took mid-pregnancy urine samples and measured them for phthalate metabolites in pregnant women. And we found that the um, metabolites of DEHP and uh, to some extent, but not as strongly, DBP produced the phthalate syndrome in the male offspring. And that is specifically that the anogenital distance, the size of the perineum, the distance between the anus and the genitals is significantly shortened with increased levels of DEHP. The penis was smaller, the scrotal size was smaller, and the testes were less completely descended. We found the phthalate syndrome in humans. And this, therefore, is identifying one cause, certainly not the only cause, of the testicular dysgenesis syndrome. So, specifically, let's take one metabolite of DEHP, and that is MEHHP, just for example. And just to give you a number for this, if the mother had levels of MEHHP in the upper quartile, this is not very high. This is what 25% of people in the United States have in their bodies today. <clears throat> then the mother was 13 times as likely to have a boy with a shortened anogenital distance compared to a mother who had MEHHP in the lowest quartile. So this is a very big number for epidemiology, 13 times. It is based on you know, a relatively small sample. We are replicating that. But it is certainly suggestive of a very strong association. Oh, one minute? Oh, my gosh. It's two. <laughs> OK. I want to tell you that shortened anogenital distance does matter. It matters in adults. It matters in rodents. In humans, we find that boys Young men who have a shortened anogenital distance have a lower sperm count. Other studies have found that they are more likely to be infertile, have reduced testosterone, and in children it's associated with hypospadias. So shortened anogenital distance is actually a very good marker um, of uh, this TDS. I don't have time to uh, hear that to tell you very much about this behavior. Huh? You found your family. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, but to tell you that um, phthalates um, also affect the brain. The brain is the largest sex organ in the body. And anything, you know, it's dependent on testosterone, as, as are the genitals. And we have a series of studies now showing that phthalates affect behavior, and our study in particular showing that boys with higher levels of these DEHP metabolites and DBP metabolites are less likely to play in a male typical manner. Um, this using a test that's been standardized in a number of environmental and clinical settings. 
So what about these um, phthalates that w are getting into the mother? How do people protect themselves? That's an important part of the conversation here. This woman is trying, but she cannot protect herself. She cannot protect herself because the information is not available to her. She cannot do much <laughs> to make sure that, for example, DHP is kept out of her body. And why is that? Because food is the primary source of DEHP. And this is a very quick, uh, very beautiful study out of Germany which shows that if you take some volunteers, you measure these metabolites and then you put them on a fast and they take no food in, only water, you see that they have no, no DEHP in their bodies. They have changed nothing else. And there are a couple of other studies that support this. So we cannot remove these chemicals from our bodies as long as manufacturers are including phthalates in the production and packaging and processing of these foods. 